Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that even with the distraction in the nation's capital, the, the real action is happening here. We've got about 120 participants online. So Dorothy, we've come through with a great audience for uh, Ed today. Ed Taylor is a Vice Provost and Dean of the Undergraduate Academic Affairs at the UW, my alma mater. Dr. Taylor is a professor at the College of Education, which he joined in 1995. His research and teaching center on comparative education in the US and South Africa, moral dimensions of education, integrative education, and leadership in education and social justice. He's a published author and quite active in the community. He's a founding board member of Rainer Scholars. He serves on the board of Seattle Foundation, is a trustee of Gonzaga, is on Seattle Mayor's Educational Summit Advisory Group, and also serves on boards of College Spark Washington and the Rwanda Girls Initiative. He sounds like a great Rotarian to me. Ed, I'm pleased to turn the podium over to you. Okay, you can see my slides okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I'm going to, let, let me get my, my sub set up here for a second. So thank you for having me. Um, thank you for spending time with me on a, on a day that's so momentous and at a moment like this that's so momentous. Um, and I, I'm just looking at the chat and I'm seeing some, some dear friends and colleagues that I've been able to walk in this city together with and so, so grateful to be, to be among you. I want to talk about um, a course I was able to teach this year. Um, it was really about, about 2020 when, when Beth asked me to, um, to visit with you um, some months ago. She said, what might you talk about? And I said, I'm doing this interesting course. Um, but the first thing I said was yes to, to coming. Then I thought, I'll figure out what I'll say afterwards because I just want to be in your, in your company and I'm, I'm glad that I'm here. Um, here's an image of, of the flyer for the course that, that my colleague, Kirsten Attic, who's, who's here actually, created. And you, and you see there's so much in this image. We knew coming in this year that we'd be facing a pandemic, we'd be facing issues related to race in America, and we had an election coming. And, and the least that we could do, the least that I could do, is provide a course for students where we bring the very best of our faculty um, in front of our students, even though it would be virtual. And so I had the opportunity to, to bring together over 20 faculty and community leaders. And I'm going to talk about some of them, just a few of them. I'm going to bookend this talk because it, it's their work that, that impressed me who were deeply, deeply impressed with you. Um, and there's a question that I asked every one of them, which was um, not just about their scholarship, not just about their research, but my question to them was, how did you get here? And, and I did interviews with all of them and just said, what brought you here and how did you get here? Um, you may not know these faces, but in the green um, jacket is Megan Ming Francis, who's a, a scholar in political science and is from Seattle, grew up here, went away to Princeton and came back to be a faculty member here, and she's an absolute star. The, the extent to which we make advances around race and equity in this community will be in large measure because of work that Megan is doing as a scholar and as a teacher. Below her in the blue jacket is Kate Starbird. For, for those of you who, who have been following um, all of this research around misinformation and disinformation, Kate is at the leading edge of that, of that work and is an absolute superstar in our human-centered design and engineering. For those of you that have been around the state long enough, and if you follow women's basketball, Kate Starbird um, should be known as someone who was one of the absolute best that ever come out of the state of Washington. She went on to Stanford, she's in the Hall of Fame at Stanford, was a player of the year during her time at Stanford, but she's known to us as really one of the star faculty on um, at, at this university. Um, Bob Stacy in, in the tie there, there's Bob smiling. Bob is the Dean of Arts and Sciences and re is retiring this year. I invited Bob to be a part of the class along with a group of other faculty. And, and um, I asked Bob because he's at the end of his career. He's a medieval scholar. And Bob, Bob said something that cracked me up. He said, you know, medievalists should never be relevant in the 21st century. Um, so when we're asked to be interviewed, it means we're talking about things like the Black Plague. So Bob said something that actually haunted me in, in my interview with Bob. His question was just a simple question that he asked of the students, which is, are we living lives that are worthy of those who have served and sacrificed before us? Sounds like a simple and powerful question, but Bob asked it in the context of, of one thing. 
um, his son, Will Stacy, a local boy, joined the Marines. And six months before he was to, to be to return home, um, he was killed in Afghanistan. Bob continued to go to work every day and hasn't missed a work uh, a day of work in, in his life. And what gets him up each day, he says, is that he desires to live a life that is worthy of those that have sacrificed before him. It's a question that that indeed haunts me. The question, how did you get here? So I want to I want to start with yes, I, this this was a course that we taught for for um, 500, close to 600 students at all three three campuses. And the question that I posed to them was, how did you get here? So the more interesting part of the story that I want to present to you is, is this question, and it was a question that was posed to, to me, it's a nice kid like you doing in a place like this. For those of you who are old enough, you know where this comes from. It's from Alice in Wonderland. So what may haunt you later on tonight is you may actually have that song in the back of your head, what's a nice kid like you doing in a place like this. Give me, let me give you a backdrop on um, and I underlined the word nice there because I want you to attend to that word for a moment. What is a place like this? I'm going to move through a few slides fairly quickly because um, I don't need you to pay deep attention. But ones I want you to pay attention to, I'll, I'll hover around a bit. Here's the University of Washington. Here's an aerial view of, of where I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting in Mary Gates Hall, not far from that fountain. And this is a typical day, although there are very few students, if any, on, on our campus now. And some of you are alumni, some of your kids have gone to the university here. We've been touched by this university. Nearly everyone in this room has been touched by the university. You've gone to a football game, UW Med Medical Center, um, public health policy, so much work. Maybe you've gone to media theater, maybe you've gone to the, to the library, but it, it's an important and impactful place. And I'm honored to be here. Here are a few things that we matter nationally, we matter globally. We generate revenue and taxes for the state. All counties are represented in at our university. These are 2019 and 2020 incoming class data. And what's striking is that right now, um, students have applied and we're looking at admissions now for students. The numbers are going to look very similar to the way they did before the pandemic. So we'll have more than 45,000 applicants. We'll have about 8,500 students admitted. And the numbers, I'm not going to make any commentary about, gen about gender here, but um, a whole lot more females than we, do, than we do males. I'm not sure what that's about, but we've got work to do, young men. Here is kind of a symbol of the work that I get to do. <clears throat> if you look closely at this image, it's over 5,000 students, our first year students, freshmen and transfer. And this would be the fall of 2019. Many of our people in this in this W had no idea what was to come in 2020, but in fall of 2019, <clears throat> we've been 5,000 students, and you have to see you have to actually to see what's going on here because we have a handful of staff that have escorted all of these freshmen and transfer students over to the football field. We've gently asked the football team to scoot over for a little bit and have our students actually form a, a W, and. We didn't do this this year, we did this online, but these students are standing next to each other. They're holding hands, they're playing rock, paper, scissors, they're passing water bottles between one another. Something that I think we took for granted at the moment because we just didn't know that the pandemic would actually change the shape of that, of that W. All of our students are distanced at the moment. But that's the, the work that we, that we do. And here's the unit that I represent, some of the work that I, that I do. <clears throat> it's, a powerful, it's a powerful body of work and it's a powerful mission for me. So what's a nice kid like you doing in a place like this? Let me tell you how I got here. I'm from, from those of you, because I heard some of you are from Santa Barbara, have ties in Santa Barbara. A couple of you may know where this is, but I'm from Lompoc, California. And most of you aren't going to know where Lompoc is unless you hang around Santa Barbara or unless you've seen the movie Sideways. Have you seen the movie Sideways? Because so, it's kind of set in the background there. And Lompoc's there where that star is on the, on the coast. I describe Lompoc as having really three grand institutions. One, Vandenberg Air Force Base is, is there. So there's a military base. That's one grand institution that would take young men and women that graduated from my high school and many of my classmates went to the military. So this idea of peace was not abstract to any of us, especially those of us that grew up in the backdrop. So this would have been in the backyard of, of my neighborhood. The B-52 bombers would go over our heads in the 1960s and the 1970s, and we knew the seriousness of 
of what that meant for, for us. We would do duck and cover drills and get underneath the desk and hold our heads, our hands behind our head and, and pray for peace. Not in an abstract kind of way, but in a way that, that John F. Kennedy did in 1963 in his speech at American University. What kind of peace do I mean? What kind of seek do I, do I, what kind of peace do I seek? A genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life worth living. We understood that and we understood that as young people because we wanted our people to come home. The other grand institution in Lompoc was a federal penitentiary. I hope none of you are familiar with this, with this place. Um, this would have been a place when I grew up and when I was in Lompoc that um, you might have been familiar with because some of the Watergate guys went there. This is where um, it was a, a white collar prison where Haldeman and, and Ehrlichman went to write their memoirs. Over the years, this would become the kind of industrial prison that has become a problem in this in this country. We imprison more than 2.3 million people. Um, we incarcerate more than 2.3 million people, most of them black and brown bodies in this in this prison. By the time I left that town, we would have to maneuver around this prison to get to the beach and pretend that people weren't in there. We had to somehow render them invisible, like Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. I am an invisible man, no, I'm not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms, Ralph Ellison said. I'm a man of substance of flesh and bone. I might even be said to possess a mind. I'm invisible simply because people refuse to see me. We had to operate in the community as if we didn't see a prison and the prisoners in it right up the block from, from us. The third grand institution that I would point out is, is in Lompoc, in addition to the military, in addition to the prison, was, was public schools. We all went to public school. Everyone that was in the town went to public schools. That's me on the left with the arrow pointing to me. And that's my friend Darcy. This might have been a middle school or my freshman year when I was getting awards. I was getting outstanding student awards. I was getting outstanding citizenship awards. Michael Jackson, you're, you're here. I was getting YMCA related awards because I was a YMCA kid. I spent all my days in YMCAs. And, and I got awards and recognitions for being just a good citizen and a, and, a good, and a good student. In my town, in my community, not many people actually graduated from high school. A surprising number of people graduated from high school, around 62% in the 70s, far fewer. Going to college was, was the exception, not the, the rule. This would probably have been the year, the last time I got an academic award, because I started getting awards of a different kind when I got to high school, because I grew up a little bit and um, grew up enough that I was handed a basketball and, and, and asked to play. And so um, I made the varsity my freshman year and started playing. That picture on the left, the action photo, somehow the, the Lompoc record, my hometown newspaper managed to get that photo on the front page of the paper three times. It is a horrid picture, a horrid picture. And three, three different times that, that that picture was on the front page of the paper. The other one is me standing next to my mother and a friend of mine named, named Bryce, who was a cross town rival. Um, and Bryce and I managed to play well enough and we managed to have decent enough games that we were both offered a, a scholarship. We were offered a basketball scholarship. Um, Steve Boyd's on the line here and Steve will remember a little bit of this. I went to Gonzaga University and, and I went to Gonzaga on a, on a basketball scholarship. And so I showed up in Spokane, the first flight that I'd ever taken when I left Lompoc was to, was to come to Spokane, Washington. Now, Spokane was an interesting place in the late 70s and in, in the early 80s. Um, it was a wonderful place, a marvelous place, but nearby across the, across the Idaho border. Idaho was also Hayden Lake and, um, and Coeur d'Alene were the hub of Aryan na nation activity. That was, that was the tension in, in Idaho. But no more big of a tension for me than um, a couple of encounters I had that were significant encounters. The first, as a 17 year old, when I stepped foot on that campus, I went to the bookstore and I bought books. The first book that I bought, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Letters and Papers from Prison. The second book I bought was a statistics book. And then I bought a biology book and then I bought a theology book. And I had a room in the dorm and I had a room by myself, which is a mistake that a first generation student should not make. You shouldn't live by yourself. You should find yourself connected to community. And I did not. And so the first challenge I had was this, was Bonhoeffer. I had that book and I sat there and I looked at it and I tried and I tried to read it. And I couldn't understand it. I couldn't read it. 
I would go to class and my classmates in classes of 15 or 16 could all read this and they all seemed to understand it. They all seemed to understand statistics and I struggled with this. I didn't understand what this guy was saying, couldn't, couldn't get it. I would go into my room and I would sit down and I would pray, God, please help me get through this, get me through this moment. Now the irony of my prayer that, that I'd be removed from this misery was the whole point of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book is that if you believe in God, that God does not work day ex ex machina and rescue you during difficult times. You have to find your way through it. Bonhoeffer is a German theologian who was imprisoned after a plot to assassinate Hitler. He was eventually, he was eventually killed for that as a, as a crime. So here I am praying for God to help me understand Bonhoeffer and Bonhoeffer saying it doesn't work that way. You've got to figure this out. My statistics class caused me all kinds of, of trouble. I, I just couldn't figure my way through it. So I met this professor, Elizabeth Cole, who is a psychology and statistics professor, who looked at me during an office hour and she said, you have a couple of problems, young man. She said, one problem is you're a basketball player and you have to figure out why you're here. And if it's to play basketball, that's one thing, but to go to school, it's something, it's something different and you have to figure out why you're here. I was so offended by, by her telling me this. She looked me in the eye and told me that I have to figure out why I'm there. The second thing she said that I, the problem I had was, she said, you don't have a statistics problem. St stats is not your problem. You have a math problem because you're, you're not good at math. And for you to do stats, you got to be better at math. So you got two problems. You don't know why you're here. And secondly, you have a math problem that you have to work through. The third problem that I had was, was this. I was on a basketball scholarship and, and I didn't know my way around it, a campus. And so, what I, what I didn't know, so when you watch college football or college basketball during a season, during Thanksgiving, during Christmas, and during the holidays, what you're watching are students. You're watching student athletes, and I was one of those students, assuming we were on television. And so here was part of the dilemma, that I had students all around me who knew how to do school, and, and I did not. One of the struggles that I had was that I realized that as I was sitting and holding this Bonhoeffer book, that that was the first book that I'd ever been asked to read. I managed to go through high school and not be asked to read a, a single book, that this would be the first I'd have to read, that I'd never done stats, that I took math from a wrestling coach. And when I took a sociology of education course, what I learned was that there are different types of schools for different kinds of, kinds of kids. This is a lesson for 2021 as well, that, that schools serve different functions. They're working class schools. I wasn't intended to be here. What's a nice kid like you doing in a place like this? I wasn't supposed to be here. I wasn't supposed to be at Gonzaga. I was supposed to be working. There were kids that were prepped for this moment. And I realized that there's such a thing as prep schools, Gonzaga prep, Bellarmine prep, Seattle prep, and students were prepped for that moment. I was, I was not. I wasn't prepped to understand how school works. So come December, when students went away to college, and we had basketball practice December 21st, December 22nd, and December 23rd. I realized I couldn't go home and I couldn't afford to go home. So I told my mother, I called her and I said, you know, mom, I, I want you to appreciate the fact that at, on college campuses and at places like Spokane, everybody stays here for Christmas. So I want you to wish me well, but I have to stay here because I have to stay with other students. I lied to her. Um, I told my classmates that I was, that I was going home for, for Christmas. And so um, come the holidays, what I didn't know is the little school like Gonzaga, when the last person leaves the, the building, the last administrator leaves, they turned the lights off. So I came back from practice one evening. I had my basketball under my arm and I had sweats on. And I went to my dorm and turned the knob and it didn't open. And I went to another door, dorm, and turned the knob and it didn't open. And I'm standing there in the snow in basketball sweats and I had to find a place to stay. So I went to this house. It's called Campus House. Steve will know this. This isn't the image of it, but it's an image. And I jimmied the window and I climbed inside of this house um, that was cold, the heat was off. And so I sat there uh, waiting to be found out. And, and I discovered that in neighborhoods in the Northwest, unlike California, people stack wood in their backyards. So I started roaming through backyards and picking up wood and, and I, I started a fire to keep myself warm. And there was a particular morning when I was roaming in the backyard and, and in somebody's shed and picking up wood and I looked up and I saw a family um, a mother and a father and kids opening Christmas presents. And I realized, my God, it's Christmas day and I'm stealing wood in this, in this backyard. I ran back to the house and I called my mother and I said, I'm having a joyous time. It's a, lovely time. a gentleman walked into the room 
into his house and saw me sitting there and he asked what I was doing. And I said, I'm just, I'm waiting for a cab. I'm, I'm going home. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yep, I'm, I'm waiting for a cab. So he goes outside and he sits in his car and he looks into the house and I stare out the window and I look at him and he looks at me and I look at him. And we just stared at each other and then he drove off. And I waited to see if the police were gonna arrive. Um, nothing happened. But I will say that this man's name was Stan Fairhurst and Stan for the next four years that I lived in Spokane would bring me home with him and, and with his family for, for Christmas, for, for every holiday, spent the next few years with the Fairhurst family. Um, some of you who are lawyers might know um, Stan's daughter, Mary Fairhurst. Mary is a former Supreme Court Justice and Mary and the Fairhurst family became like, like family to me. Um, I, I decided at some point um, at Gonzaga that I wanted to do school, I wanted to be there, I wanted to try to play basketball and I wanted to be in school. And I wanted to be successful at this like other students. And I wanted to go to graduate school. Um, and to get to graduate school, I had to ask for a letter of recommendation. I thought, well, who else will I go to for a letter of recommendation than the most evil professor on campus, the statistics professor, this one who, who I thought was just an awful, awful human being. And I used to call her Dr. Evil. So I, so I thought, I'm going to go to her my senior year and ask her for a letter of recommendation. And she's going to tell the truth. She's either going to say I should get into graduate school or I should not. And I got into graduate school. I had her seal the envelope and I got into graduate school. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I, I eventually went to graduate school at the University of Washington and got my doctorate here and have been teaching. I got tenure here. And, and when I became a dean and moved into Mary Gates Hall and I got my computer set up, my first email was to doc, Dr. Cole, to Dr. Evil. And I wrote to her and I said, um, you taught me stats many, many years ago. You taught me math and you stuck with me. And I wrote her a note and I said, you won't remember me. I used to wear a red sweater and I used to show up every day to your office hours. And she wrote back immediately and she said, Eddie, call me. Um, she said, call me. And so I picked up the phone and I called her and I said, Dr. Cole, how are you? And she said, well, I'm fine, but two things. Um, since you left Gonzaga, I, I quit teaching. And I thought, oh my God, I had that kind of impact on you. I made you, I drove you out of teaching. And she said, it wasn't you. I, I wasn't a very good teacher. And she said, the second thing, I've joined the Sisters of Providence. I've joined a nun. So this woman I've been calling Dr. Evil is now Sisters of Providence nun. Several years ago, she invited me back for her 20 years um, recognition as a nun. And, and here's Dr. Cole and myself. I won't call her Dr. Evil anymore. <laughs> And we got to sit together with other nuns and we talked about my math problem and, and that I've been okay since then. I'm an educator. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, I've, I've been a part of founding of the founding board member of the Rainer Scholars Program, which, which in some ways is, is a bit of, of, of me just turning back and, and serving in some way. Um, Rainer Scholars is a program to get young kids to go to, to, go to college and it follows kids all the way through so that they are prepped. So kids that like me get prepped and they're followed all the way through completion of college. Rainer Prep, you started a, a public charter school with Maggie O'Sullivan and, and some colleagues from Amazon. We all sit on the board together. We started a, a prep middle school to prep kids for, for, for college. Dream Project was, was one of the programs I've, I oversee. You see our president, Donna Marie Kelsey there, outreach to young people to try to create access to college. These are the kinds of things I think about in my work, the qualities that I admire in people and in our students that we aspire in our students and in our faculty, qualities that I admire that people listen and they hear, they can read and understand, they can think and talk to anyone, can write clearly and persuasively, can solve pu puzzles and problems and vote well, respect rigor, practice humility, and they connect. The course I brought together faculty and, and at every moment I was there, I asked them how you got here. Um, and I would think to myself, what's a nice kid like you doing in a place like this, surrounded by really incredible people, the Saksacha brain who reminds us of the land that we're on, Cordell Carter, an, an alum who heads up the Socrates Institute and reminds us of the importance of democracy and what, co what constitutes we in this, we the people. Ben Danielson, you've heard about Ben recently, Ben has left. Odessa Brown, but Ben has spent the last 30 years of his life serving kids and serving families, especially the most marginalized. Ginny Gilder is a, hill, uh, is a hero of mine, um, Olympic rower, but co-owner of the Seattle Storm that won a championship during 2020 and did so by doing incredible things and making a statement in support of Brianna 
Breonna Taylor. Alexis Harris, um, sociologist, pre preeminent sociologist in the country. And we're lucky to have her here at the University of Washington. That reminds us that the prison industrial system is just wrong. There are too many people in prisons like Lompoc and Margaret O'Mara, who reminds us that history matters, that we should be three-dimensional. She's a brilliant, brilliant scholar. That the lessons that I take from the course are not much different than the lessons that I think are lessons of all time. Um, because of my work, I've had a chance to, to spend some years in, in South Africa. The woman in, in the picture next to me, is her name is Carolyn Mall McKinstry, and, and she's an inspiration to me in part. She was in the, the 16th Street Baptist Church in 1963 when a Klan bomb exploded. She happened to be upstairs, and the other four little girls were downstairs, and they were killed, and she survived. She's written a book on, on truth and reconciliation and repair. She's gotten herself to a place to, to talk about forgiveness and peace. Desmond Tutu in, influenced the entire nation, talks about ordinary acts of love and, and hope. It's a lesson that matters. I was fortunate enough a little more than a year ago to visit His Holiness the Dalai Lama um, with a group of scientists that talked about love, compassion, the very things that you talked about to start this meeting. Without them, we simply cannot survive. The science of compassion is what he's interested in. Brian Stevenson, who, and I'll be surprised if he does not win a Nobel Peace Prize at some point, that reminds us the importance of mercy and the, the importance of getting proximate to suffering, that we can't be distant from suffering. We actually have to suffer together and we have to solve the problems and those problems that are downtown, those problems that are cross borders, that just mercy. I end with, with a, a simple glad I stayed and there's, and there's me with some of my teammates and, and classmates. Um, there are a few things that I, that I take from the moment when we took this picture together, and this was in 2017, um, and I got on a bus with, with some of my teammates and, and, and felt as though I'd made it. And, and I, I remember standing in this picture thinking, what's a nice kid like you still doing here? Um, but also asking questions that I think are relevant for all of you in 2021. How and why did I move forward? And how did any of us move forward through 20? 2021 to 2020 to 2021. How do we move forward? Have I lived my daily life in a manner that is worthy of the sacrifice of those who served before me? Who did not come forward? You notice that, that that classmate of mine from high school is not in this picture. And when I graduated, I believe I was the only African-American male to graduate in my, in my class. Who did not come forward and why? Did I do enough to help them come forward? What are the necessary habits and behaviors and conditions that enable us all to feel as though we belong? How do we emerge from 2020 into 2021, a community that is liberated, that is intelligent, that is healthy and courageous in, in, in view of the challenges that we face? Those are my thoughts for now. Let's have questions if you'd like. Ed, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We have a couple of questions in the wings. Uh, the first one, oh, I see. Uh, how do you see the UW undergrad experience evolving as students hopefully return to campus later in 2021? Um, and later in 2021 is, is the goal. We're looking at fall as a possibility because as vaccines um, and as herd immunity, excuse the term, that we're trying to imagine having students back in the fall. Our enrollments look really good. Students are excited to come. And is the question, how do we see, um, what, what's the question? Excuse me, what's the experience look like when they come back? It's going to be, it's going to be different in part because even post vaccination, students will still need to wear masks and they'll still need to practice social distancing and they'll still need to practice good habits at, at that point. And that will be hard for 18, 19, 20 year olds. So that big W will not look like that big W again. So we're gonna have to practice good habits. We're going to have to make sure that we're a safe campus. So things will emerge slowly again. It won't look normal again. We're also probably going to need to do some hybrid forms of teaching. We won't be all virtual. Um, students will want to come back, but there will be some students for whom we'll be able to serve in different parts of the state and we'll be able to do it in, in hybrid forms as well. So we won't be all virtual, but we'll have a mix. So the experience will be different. We'll have, we'll have faculty back in classrooms. I'm teaching a class tonight, Example for example, it's a face-to-face -face class with international students. There'll be 30 students in the class. 
they'll be spread out in the lecture hall that is for 700 students and we'll all be wearing masks and it'll be a different kind of experience. Students are anxious to get back together again. Of the students that were in this class of mine, the thing that they said the most is that they're anxious to be in community with one another. They've learned a lot through the virtual ex experience, but they wanna be together. They wanna be in residence halls together. They wanna be in classrooms together. They wanna be in fraternities and sororities together. So we have to make it safe for them and they have to make it safe for each other. I, I think I just heard you say that even when things come back to normal-ish, that they'll still have to wear masks. How long do you reckon people will have to wear masks? You know, I, I don't know because I'm not the epidemiologist, but I was talking to, um, to Chris Murray, who's with our Institute of Health Metrics yesterday. And one concern that he expressed that I think we should all, we should all hear is that once vaccinations happen, he's concerned that to get to herd immunity, what's once vaccination, we actually still need to practice those good habits and still need to wear a mask because the concern is really the, the getting vaccinations across, across the masses to get to that place of, of herd immunity. So I imagine that it's gonna be a while before we are, are getting back to what, what, what we consider normal. And it will be hard and unnatural for students to, to not be in touch with each other and not be. Uh, I, don't I, don't think too, I don't want to go too far with that, but it's going to be very hard for students, but we'll find a way to do it. I don't think there's a problem to just students face. I think that could be a human thing now. All right, quick, another question. What is the current gap between the UW academic environment, student experience, and the preparation for community service, citizen needs, for which graduates should prepare to contribute? Mm, it's an interesting question. So the gap between the the student experience and citizen needs. I, I so it, here's my role because part of my role is service learning and, and civic engagement, and and student engagement. It's a different campus than it was for those of you who are alum. I think in some ways we do a better job in the undergraduate experience than we have really ever. And so I hear people who are alums who graduated in the 70s who describe a very different kind of campus environment than the one now. We are still a big public campus. Um, we do something called holistic admissions. So as part of the entry in, um, it matters if students are good students, that they've their, their test scores are, are, are good and they've done well in school. But more than anything, we want them to be good citizens. So that's part of the criteria for getting into the university. Phil Ballinger and I, who, um, and Phil is the former um, Vice President of, of Enrollment, wrote a piece in the Spokesman Review about valuing character over um, over statistics, basic, basically. And it comes out of a study from Harvard that is pushing against this piling on effect. So this is basically students that are trying to get in by saying, I've done this, I've done this, I've this, I've taken AP courses and IB courses. In this piling on, what we're asking students now is to think about maybe doing less, but doing more service and engaging more deeply and engaging in kind of civic engagement as a way to enter in and taking the pressure off being perfect, but just being thoughtful citizens at the entry point of the university. So we want to actually start to send those messages early. We want to make sure that we send messages of engagement and civic engagement all the way through. So the university actually completed what's called a Carnegie classification last year, which is a charge for us to be more involved in the issues that matter to all of you, more involved in service and engagement around in, in downtown, in South Seattle. So having our students and faculty engaged and making the city better. We've become more of an urban university than ever before. We are, our fate is tied to the well-being of our city. So, um, so my job and part of my goal is to close the gap between um, civic engagement and the daily lives of those of us that live in communities and the experience of our students. I dig it. Ed, thank you so much for being here today. If I didn't get to your question, forgive me. Uh, we've run out of time, uh, but thank you so much for being with here and sharing your wisdom and good luck this year. Thank you for having me.